Hey, everybody. Welcome to Screw the Stock Market. Uh, today, we had a guest on uh, Cody Davis, and um, he talks. he's going to share with us a little bit about how his whole mindset is just very, very unique, very different to what a lot of other multifamily real estate investors are doing. Uh, what do you think of the show, Aziz? I thought it was awesome. I thought it was great. Um, it was very actionable. It was direct. He talks about his journey talks about the steps he took. Um, it resonated really, really well with uh, basically what we're doing and, you know, what we've been talking about and preaching on our show and to other people in our circles that we speak to on a regular basis. So um, it's great. I mean, uh, to sum it up in something that's uh, a little bit more succinct, it's, he essentially talks about how he went from being a, you know, broke uh, college student, recent college graduate, um, I think what they say he graduated in 2018 um, with like three thousand dollars. Was high school or college? I I'm honestly sure. don't he's, know. He's very young, but, <laughs> but he's young. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just three thousand dollars in his pocket, and you know, a few years later, now he owns a resort and like you know five million dollars in real estate and all sorts of things, and it's continuing to grow. Uh, and he just started, you know, three years ago. Um, so it's yeah, really, so, really encouraging and it's really, really kind of like motivating listening to him talk about this process. Yeah, there's very actionable things that you can start doing to uh, to build better relationships and to, to grow your network with people who are in a position to be able to help you reach your goals. That's something no matter what you're doing, whether or not it's real estate or any type of venture. Um, to be able to build relationships in this way is something that you can take and run with it. And then obviously there's the application to, to multifamily real estate. Um, so really, I hope you guys get a lot of value from it. I had the pleasure of meeting Cody several months ago. And like I said, in the, in the, in the recording, I think he's just very unique and he's very smart and he's doing things, uh, in a really smart, clever way that is actionable yeah. for all of us. So let's take it and run with it. Let's put it to action. Hey there, thank you so much for tuning into the show. You know, it means so much to me and Aziz that you are actually listening, that there's people really listening to the show. Um, we're having fun with it, and we hope that you're getting a lot of value too. Education is just one of the first steps that anyone should take when they're on a journey towards financial freedom or personal development. And so it's great. You're doing the right things. Um, I want to suggest a second step that you might want to consider if a lot of the things that we're talking about on the show are resonating with you. Consider visiting our website, legatoinvest.com slash invest. And there, there's a button where you can click to gain access to our opportunities. And what will happen is you'll schedule a call with us. We'll talk, we'll get on a Zoom, and we'll get to know your, your investment experience. We'll get to know you. We'll, we'll learn about your objectives. And then if it's a good fit, we'll actually start to present you with real investment opportunities from time to time. And you'll be in the driver's seat where you can say, no, I don't like that one. And yes, I do like that one. And those real decisions, that means that you're actually in the game towards your financial freedom. So uh, consider visiting legatoinvest.com slash invest. Again, that's L-E-G-A-D-O invest.com slash invest. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, screw the stock market. We're where we talk all about alternative investments outside of the stock market with the um, with the focus on taking control of our finances and our time and our lives. So um, I'm really excited about today's episode. We're with Cody Davis. Uh, Cody, thanks for being with us today. Appreciate you having me on. <laughs> so um, I'll, yeah, I'll brag a little bit about you first. Um, I'll just tell the little story. So in June, I went to an event in Dallas uh, focused on multifamily investors. And there was a bunch of people that spoke at that event. And a lot of them were very high level, very successful people who've done it all. A lot of them have been in the business for 20, 30 years. And then there was this young guy who went on stage and I, I met him right before. I didn't know he was about to go on stage and he looked a little bit nervous. And I think maybe a little bit in a patronizing way, I said, oh, I'm sure you'll do great, buddy. I'm, you got this. <laughs> and there's a young guy and he went up on stage and no bullshit. He was by far the most 
impressive speaker out of everyone on that stage. And so today he's with us. Cody, you've done some amazing things and you're doing things in a very unique, different way that um, a lot of other people aren't talking about. So we're excited. Oh, yeah, I'm excited um, too. And I, I needed that little bit of uh, a pep talk before going on stage. I was so nervous. Somehow didn't sweat through my shirt, but hey, we made it. And Cody, I'd I'd like to say that uh, he's not even he's not even hyping for the show. He legitimately came back from that event, and that was the only thing I heard about when he came back from the event, telling me about you and everything that you've been doing. So you did definitely left a lasting impact. Huh, there we go. That's uh, that's all I could ask for. Appreciate that. Awesome. So, um, I guess let's start just by you sharing a little bit about your journey, because maybe some so a lot of people in our audience might not, might not know what you've done and and where you started, but they can see probably from the video. Well, the people who are watching the video will be able to see that you're a relatively young guy. Uh, why don't we just start maybe two three years ago, and and you could tell us a, a brief history of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, three years ago, I didn't own anything. I had absolutely nothing. I had $3,000 saved up. That was a, a mix of working as a gymnastics coach. I'd done that for four years. And I ended up stopping doing that when I got into real estate. got too busy. The time commitment was a lot trying to get started as a real estate agent. And what ended up happening, I had gone to college for two quarters. I graduated high school 2018, jumped straight into Tacoma Community College. I didn't want a whole bunch of student loans. Fast forward, I've got a lot of debt. I didn't want any debt, so I didn't go to a <laughs> prestigious college. Originally going to UPS, got a whole bunch of scholarships, was still going to walk away with five figures of student loans. I was like, that's a lot. So I got my real estate license uh, shortly after going to Tacoma Community, and I didn't take out any student loans to go to the community college. My thought was I can go learn business, I can go learn kinesiology, and I can eventually be a chiropractor. That was the original train of thought. Well, I made a post on a Facebook group and there was a real estate group. And I was like, I'm just looking for a mentor because my high school civics teacher had told me that uh, you should learn about real estate. He had a one last school day. It was last day of school before everybody graduated and he was retiring that year. So he decided to teach everybody about real estate. And so I got that idea and all my buddies were like, well, yeah, but you can't buy $5,000 houses which is what he was telling us is what he did. And it's like, okay, I can't buy a $5,000 house in Tacoma. But I was looking for a mentor. And so I put that online on a Facebook group and someone uh, invited me to the real estate brokerage. They said, you just need to get your license. And if you can do it in a month or less, I'll pay for it. It's like, great, because I got no money. And so I got my license start to finish in two and a half weeks. Six months after that, I still had sold nothing. It took over six months, got my first deal sold. It was a duplex. One of my old gymnastics buddies called me up. I had no clients. I had no family, no friends in the business. And one of my old gymnastics buddies called me up. It's like, hey, can you help me buy a house? I was like, well, yeah, but I'd read Rich Dad Poor Dad at this time. I was like, what if you bought a duplex? And so I helped him buy a duplex. This was before the market started going crazy. So we got into a duplex with three bed, one bath units for 300000 And he did... I think he put 20% down on that, but 20% down conventional. I don't think he qualified for, for FHA with that big of a loan at the time. So he had to put more money down and he got into it. And that was what sparked the adventure because just three months after that, I bought my first seller financed 12 plex. And fast forward three years, I, I had bought my first 12 plex October, I think it was October 29th of 2019. So we're nine days out from the three-year anniversary of that. But fast forward today, I got 108 rental units in a resort without a bank loan. Oh, are you sitting in the resort right now? Yeah, I am. It's, uh, I don't know if this is going to butcher the quality, but hey, just no, this is okay. one of the suites. So, so tell us a, a little bit more about the resort. because. Yeah, so the A-frame building, uh, this was actually built by Don Beckman, who partnered with Walt Disney way back when. He was set designer, and this is the Robin Hood Village Resort over in Union. If you want to check it out, robinhoodvillageresort.com. But this was built by the Disney crew to remember 
and commemorate the Robin Hood movie that they released in 1934. So this this was for that movie, and it was built by the Disney team, Don Beckman. So he built this front building. It used to be a pub. It, like, they used to have a, a little restaurant and a, and a bar. And Bill Gates is the property neighbor. So I'm, I'm the broke boy on the block. Across the street, we got Bill Gates. Then we got the Nordstrom family, and we got Jeff Rakes. And, you know, they're all billionaires. So... Here I am with my little resort, and they got their huge complexes right over across the street. But um, waterfront, 20 cabins, uh, 20 total spaces anyway. Uh, I think there's 15 other cabins and then this building. And then I just bought the triplex with Christian. Christian and I bought this together. Bought the triplex next door to this. It came up on uh, Zillow for sale. Called them up. They seller financed it to us. And we closed on that this week. And so that's going to become the Robin Hood Lodge. That's got a sauna and another hot tub and unobstructed water view. But yep. And it's two and a half acres just on the other side of the creek. So we're going to build a bridge and get some golf carts so we can golf cart over the bridge over to that property and the sauna. But uh, the story is worth more than the real estate. And I found that to be true always. And the resort is cool. I paid, we paid four and a half million for this resort. We paid 900,000 for the triplex next door. Before the previous owner had this resort, it was owned by one couple, the Woodcocks. And they, they owned the Robin Hood and they owned the triplex. And then they, they sold it off separately and it got separated. And so we were able to bring a piece of history back together I don't want to redo history like a lot of people in Seattle do, but I do want to be able to share it with the world. And so we we saw that and we're like, this is our only opportunity to, to bring this back together. We're going to do that. And now we can share the history of the Robin Hood with everybody else. And just the story alone to us is worth more than we paid for it. Now, I mean, that that, that whole accomplishment is amazing, first of all. So Thank congrats you. and good on you. That's, that's great. From, you know, $3,000 in your bank account to owning you know, uh, what is it now, a $5 million property when you consider both of them combined together? Yeah. That's spectacular. Um, can you walk us through how you made that transitional jump? Like, how did, you, how did you finance that whole deal with nothing in your pocket to begin with? Yeah, so the seller financed the majority of it. $5.4 million of total purchase didn't cost us a dime. Uh, and so the the seller's total financing out of that. We got 705,000 out of the triplex and then we got three and a half million out of the resort. So we still had to come up with you know, a million too. And so they're in different LLCs. One thing that we did, we have an investor on the triplex and they're a good friend of ours. And so we'll see down the road. We do want to to buy them out eventually, you know, way down the road, but we don't have to do that. So what we did is we um, we're doing a lease option from the from the Robin Hood LLC with an option to buy over there. So the lease payment covers their cash flow requirements. So we raised the money over there, and so our lease from Robin Hood to the Triplex pays all the mortgage, all the utilities, all the bills, pays management fees, and pays them. And then we just have to rent it out as rental arbitrage from ourselves, but um, brought it in as an equity partner. And then on this one, uh, we we want to stay with them for a while because they're good friends. Like, we love hanging out with them and they want to come down. We'll play spike ball in the front yard and it's got two and a half acres, got a lot of land. But over here, the Robin Hood's got nine and a half acres and we want this to ourselves. So we brought in one equity partner, which was a, a phone call. Didn't have this in the beginning, had to build relationships over time. Phone call, grabbed coffee, needed a million dollars. They gave us a million dollars. And I mean, they didn't even do any due diligence. It was just trust from relationships of people I didn't know three years ago. But built the relationships over time. They wrote a check. They got a portion of the equity. We did a special allocation. So they get 100% of the cost segregation study. And we get 100% of the cash flow. So even though they have a little bit of equity, we get all the cash flow because we don't want all the, the tax benefits because we bought enough real estate last year where we're just going to start writing everything off. And um, they wanted the tax benefits. So we gave them that. 
in a special allocation. We got a special allocation for 100% of the cash flow. And we're structuring the note to where the cash flow from our real estate will pay them off. So we got the real estate to buy the real estate. So we won't have any investors. We got a secured buyout agreement and the just the cash flow from all the assets will will buy them out. So it won't cost us a dime. So I want to highlight two two points. I think for, for our listeners, there, there's two points. So first is one thing I know that we're going to talk a lot more about is for you is the importance of relationships and how key that is. But then one of the other things, if, if you haven't been able to figure it out, is that Cody is very creative. And so, you know, it, it's there's a lot to this. And so some of those concepts that you've already talked about might already go go a little too fast for some of our audience. And I don't want anyone in, who's listening to get caught up in in the technicalities of, of the. But the point is, he's creative and he finds ways to make it win, 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 win for whoever's involved. Um and so I think that's super cool about the fact that you were able to keep all the cash flow and still your investors can keep all their uh, tax benefits because people need different things at different times. And so that's really exciting. Yeah. And I want to put it out there that I, I did go through that very quickly. My, my thought on the, the long form content like this is you can go through it quick and you get an idea. And when you realize that it's real, you just have to go study it on a, you know, a more personal level. Because getting the ideas out as fast as possible is the most important part. Some people try and understand it as they're going through the podcast, and that is a, not a good idea. You should get as many ideas as possible, realize that, oh, shoot, this is, this is real, and then go study up on it. Because I, you know, I've talked about seller financing, I talked about private equity, I talked about buyout agreements, uh, lease options for myself, from one LLC to another. And there, there's a lot in there. But if you know now that that's all real, you can go study it and you don't have to be an expert right away because you, you should just have the mind of a student always. That's what I try and do. And that helps us grow. I think um, one aspect also that I think a lot of people struggle with is with the idea of finding investors. Um, I mean, you talked about how you were able to find uh, you know, an investor that you know, had enough trust in you that they were just willing to give you about a million dollars just for this tax benefit. How do you go about building a relationship like that? How do you find, I mean, if it's a normal Joe Schmo, you know, you, you know your circle of friends and your people, none of them are multimillionaires. How are you able to kind of network into that type of opportunity and meeting those type of people? Yeah, so you establish trust when you get a takeaway from somebody, you apply it, and then you let them know that you applied it and it worked. Like that, is, that is how you build trust at the, the highest level. And something that I learned from my dad is that your reputation is worth more than anything. And so I learned that from a young age. Granted, my, my family's not in real estate yet. I'm going to change that. But he did say, you know, it's just as far as business goes, that your reputation comes first. And so I put that at the forefront of everything when it comes to building relationships with people. I have to be honest and transparent. Not only do I have to be honest, but everyone, like it has to be obvious to everybody that I'm honest and that's allowed me to build relationships, but doing the right thing over a period of time, like the, the stuff that the internet doesn't see is I went through a pretty hard partnership in the beginning, just a, a business relationship. I, I sold out of a $2 million real estate position out of my personal portfolio to pay off someone else's debt. And I was able to, to, like, to recover from it Basically, I'd partner with someone and they they racked up a bunch of bad debt. And so I took over their ownership in that portfolio in exchange. Uh, I took on all their obligations, which just happened to be one-year notes that were already overdue. So it was a whole bunch of high-pressure, expensive debt. It wasn't my obligation at all to pay it off. And none of the people that I paid off wanted me to... I mean, they, they were happy that I did it, but they're like, you don't do, don't do it. And... They wanted to just go after the other guy. But when I did that, that inspired a lot of trust in people in the, the lending space because they're like, if he's going to take care of other people's obligations, he'll take care of his own. And you know, good things come from bad times. Being able to make that phone call, I would not have gotten that million from one person had I not gone through that. Guarantee it. It would have been from three people at like 300 for two of them and 400 for one. 
and I've built relationships with people that can operate at that level. And a lot of people say, that's a lot of money. I'm like, that's a house. You know, a lot of people that own a house. Well, okay, cool. They have an asset that's worth that. So you, you break it down as a real estate problem. And I learned that from my buddy, Adam. It's like, if you make it a real estate problem, the, um, it was about half a million in a setback. So I had to sell out of the $2 million portfolio to pay that off. He's like, that's just a condo. It's like, oh, you're right. And, uh, and I, my CPA told me, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. So I, I try and remember that, but you know, make jokes about it. But that is how I built trust to get those relationships. I went through a lot of hard things that the internet didn't see because you know, social media is a highlight reel. And I don't recommend going through that stuff. If you can avoid it, just avoid it. But when you can learn from people and then you experience the real life situation, regardless whether it's loss or not, and then you apply what they taught you and you, you show them that it worked. That's where you build trust. And investors are just people. That's, that's it. Awesome. Um, that's huge. And yeah, that is one of the places. So now let's talk a, l- a little bit about something that is pretty, again, probably one of the most unique things I've heard fr- from you is your, your approach to getting seller finance deals. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I remember when we sat and, and I think I asked you something along the lines of like, why are these people doing this? Right? Like, are are you, I think I I phrased it something like, are you convincing them because of the tax benefits or something like that? And you just cut me off. You're like, no, it's completely opposite to that. So just, just share. I mean, it's just a very interesting approach and it seems to be really effective. You've done it over and over and over and over again. Could you say how many times you've done this now? Oh boy. I have a port well, I have a portfolio map I can pull up. Let me see. My I can do this in real time. It's my Google Maps. Okay. I built out because I love Google Maps. So <laughs> what I did was I, I built out a map, a uh, custom Google Maps with all the properties. So one second. Let's see. So I've done this. And, and while Cody What's that? I was going to say, while you're pulling that information up, um, Alex, you might might be beneficial to explain to people what seller financing actually means. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah. So, again, we if you have a product like a, a a home or an apartment building, and you want to buy it, most people will go to a bank to get a bank financing, and you'll put in some sort of a down payment to the seller, and the bank will make up another difference. Let's say it's twenty percent down, and eighty percent comes from the bank. Now you have a mortgage, but the seller will get all their money, 100% at closing. And then in exchange, they'll give you the property. What Cody's been able to do, which is in some real estate circles, people think, oh yeah, it's like a unicorn. You get them once in a blue moon, um, you'll get the seller who might own a property outright to say, okay, give me a 20% down payment and the 80%, you can just pay it to me as a loan over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And that's a loan from the seller to you. And so it's a way of not having to come up with all the money up front. And you can completely bypass the banks. Um, You see it a lot also when you're uh, trying to purchase businesses. Uh, I've seen that be something that's utilized a lot. Um, I haven't seen it used as much in real estate, but purchasing businesses, that's that's a big way that people get those types of deals done. And that's actually one of the things I wanted to get to. Because I know Cody has done it a lot for real estate, but I think his his approach would work for businesses or any anything pretty much. So please, Cody. Oh, 100%. See, I've done it 13 times personally, and I've helped uh, three clients do it on their own acquisitions as far as from duplex up to eightplex, some in central Washington, some in places like Kitsap County. So that'd be 16 times in the last 35 months. But, you know, it's, it's repeatable if you keep it simple. And if you let it get complicated on you, then it's not repeatable anymore. And then it's not really all that fun. But I'm working on going under contract on another sixplex right now, seller financed, and working on a, a 17 unit and a 24 unit. And those are all seller financed as well. So you know, they're, they're out there and the approach is to stop looking for them and just start meeting with owners that have done something that you want to go do and learn how they did it. The strategy is not to go buy a bunch of real estate. It's to learn how people got to a position where they own a bunch of real estate, 
take the best pieces from their story and then apply it to, to create your own. Because if you call them up and they actually offer to sell or finance it to you, great. Maybe you get a 12plex. But if you learned how they got to the position of owning 100 units or 50 units, you can use that strategy to go get 100 units, 200 units. The 12plex ends at the 12plex. It's not like you can just build 200 units on top of it. So it, I stopped looking for deals and I started looking for owners that could teach me how they played the game at their level. So, so that's huge. And especially, I think it's, in, it's particularly special, I think, when you apply it to multifamily, right? Because if you apply that to single family, the conversations might not be as interesting. Um, you know, it's like, how did you buy this house? Oh, well, I bought it. I don't know. I got a, I got a loan and I got it. And then I, I lived here for 40, 50 years or whatever. Um, when you're talking about people at that level, I think you're having good conversations with meaningful contacts and and learning really valuable lessons, which are pretty, are probably going to be very uncommon to just find anywhere you go. Can you role play with me? How, how do those conversations work? I mean, again, like, yeah, you know, walk us taking the leap from having a, a relationship <laughs> and a friendship or even a conversation, I mean, it's probably a I few mean, conversations that you're having. Are we talking about the coffee meeting when you actually, you get in person, you say hi? Because that... Are we doing that? Are we doing the phone call or what? Let's do both. Why okay. don't we just do Let's the journey, right? The initial, from, from initial the first, yeah. yeah, from the yeah, beginning just, to the, hey, do you want to buy my product? Yeah. I mean, they're offering it to you or are you? At, yeah, at some point that comes up. I don't ask them. I'll let you take the take yeah. charge. Let me, uh, let me give you the, the outline first. Something I learned from Jordan Belfort. It's good to know your negotiation play field. Some people are, you know, this is, this is where I say you should take pieces from everybody. Some folks say... I, Jordan Belfort made Cardone look like a goofball. He is a goofball. Everybody's a goofball, but you know, they pick sides instead of just taking the best pieces from the best players in each individual space to, to level up. And so I learned that, you know, you should, you should know your negotiation play field. And so I want to just illustrate the, the concept here, because this is against what everybody says to do when you're making a phone call. Um, uh, Everyone that I've seen, for one, when they're making this phone call, they're like, hi, is, is this Alex? I'm like, that, that's dumb, number one. You should say, hey, Alex, it's Cody. I'm reaching out. I saw you on a 12-plex. And the, the train of thought here is not to, I, I want to buy your 12-plex. I was curious if you were selling. The train of thought is, I saw you've owned a 12-plex. I've never done this before. I'm curious how you got there. Well, Cody, I'm not selling. I don't know how I'd buy it. That's why I called. I'm, I'm curious, how the heck did you come to owning a 12-plex? And at this stage, you don't know who the person is. I don't know You're who they are. You're talking for the first time. Yeah, they don't know who I am. I don't know who they are. They're caught off guard. They have no clue who the heck Cody is. And that's how I started my whole career. It's like, hey, I saw you on a 12. I bought a 12 in Quincy. This was my, my first deal was on the market. I mean, it was a slam dunk. It was the easiest thing that it could be. And there's deals like this all over America that are on the market, but everyone's like, oh, I got to do an off-market deal. So if you're doing the off-market deal, the train of thought is, okay, I saw you own this, never done it before. H how did you get here? It's like, well, I mean, I, I started with a sixplex. Like, oh, so you have multiple buildings. I don't even have any. I mean, I... And I'm trying to go down the train of thought to where they share just a little bit of story. And the goal is for them to share a relatable point and then for me to reciprocate a relatable point. And what I've done in, on a piece of paper is I mapped out a little circle. I was like, this is the Cody circle. And you could do it for Alex. Like you could do this for anybody. You could do it for Christian. I had Christian do this way back when. But you map out your circle and there's three sectors. You've got relatable points. And this is what we're after on this phone call. Relatable points get you in the room. People want to meet with you if you're a relatable person. The problem is people actually book these meetings. They're like, oh my gosh, it worked. I applied it and it worked. <laughs> and then they try and relate to the person over coffee. That is not what you want to do. If you spend the whole time relating to them, they're not going to want to work with you. They're like, oh, cool, this guy's me or this gal's me. And you need more than that. So what I found is when you're doing this phone call, you have the, 
the, the play field of they don't know who I am. I don't know who they are. I know that they've done something I've never done. And I know I want to get to a coffee meeting. Now you got to go play ball and you have to share the right relatable points and the right, you know, in quotes, is who you are. And you just have to share little bits and pieces of your story. And relatable points, in essence, are your past. They're going to share some of their past, usually over the coffee meeting. But when you actually get into doing the coffee meeting, you want to share goals because people work with you based on the goals that you have. And your goals are your future. So you got past, which will get you in the room. You have to figure out how to articulate that over the phone. Goals are your future. You do that when you're in the room. And then significance creates buy-in. For the owners, usually what I do in my coffee meetings, I try and figure out what changed for them when they hit their goals, which I can't know until I'm there. So like what, what actually changed? And they usually ask why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the reason that you're doing what you're doing will determine, like if they actually understand your why and it's significant, that determines how far and how fast you go. Because like that creates buy-in and buy-in gets you opportunities that no one else gets. It's the reason I can do so many seller finance deals over and over because I know how to communicate where I'm coming from, where I'm going, and, and why it, it matters. And I can get that from so they other people. So they can essentially see like the drive that you have and why you have that drive. And it's something that they can relate to. And as a result, they feel kind of like a, enough of a kinship with you that they want to help you yep. uh, progress. And I learned their stories. I sat down, one of the very first people I ever met, Central Washington. Called him up. He's like, sure, come on over. And so I met him at the property. And I got in his truck and he drove me around and he showed me his first property. It was a sixplex. He bought seller finance, 10% down, bought it for 90 grand. 9,000 down, it was all the money he had. He could have bought the land next to it for $2,000. He didn't have the money. And now the land's worth like 75. So, you know, it's gone up a lot in the last just a little bit, but he, he got started 20 years ago and he scaled from that. And eventually he had this little house with an ADU in the back that he wanted to buy. And he traded his car as the down payment. It was the car he needed. But that car, the Honda that he traded in, he since paid off that asset. And that, I, I call it a duplex because it's, it's a house with another house in the back. Uh, that bought his daughters AMGs. So, you know, I know the story behind the, the people that I met with and, and what the significant meaning was behind each of the properties. He got chased off one of his properties with a shotgun way back when from one of his tenants who was racist and, you know, they didn't know what was going on. And I, I had to go through a whole bunch of learning with other people's stories without trying to buy their stuff. But because I... I learned about their story. I'm, I'm the only person that's ever gone to them. You know, we're in very different life cycles, like parts of our life, very different parts of the business cycle, um, very different backgrounds. He came from a different country. Like we, we don't relate on everything, but he loves what I'm trying to do. And he remembers going through it way back when, when he had absolutely nothing. And I'm the first person to ever go to him and ask him how he did this. And he got to 40 units and then he started building. Developers are the richest people on planet Earth till they're not. So he had enough rentals to cash flow the negative. And just like, this is how I would do it again. And I take a little bit of from that. And eventually he sold me a 12 plex and then he sold me a six and then he sold me a duplex. Meanwhile, I was building relationships with people that owned properties around it and they were all doing the same thing. Okay, so give, give us some yeah, examples in particular <laughs> of the, the why. That's one of the ones that's, I think, a lot harder to, I mean, even, even the goals, right? I mean, like I can say, okay, I just, I want to be able to quit my job. I want to be able to retire my wife. I want to be able to so what's that take? paint pictures like that. So mm -hmm. to, to do that, to quit your job, to retire your wife, what would that take? Like do the math. Set the goal, then do the math mm -hmm. to get there. So if, if it takes 10 grand a month, you need $2 million paying you 6%. Because two million times six percent, hundred twenty grand a year, ten grand a month. You don't have to go that fast, but you just map it out, and you're like, okay, I want to, I want to be there. And if you want to make fifteen grand a month, it's three million dollars. Twenty grand a month, four million dollars. So you just have to figure out how do I buy four million dollars of assets, 
and let my tens paid off? And if I want to do it faster, how do I leverage $16 million of assets, get it to go up 25% and pay me 6% on the equity? Because if you could borrow 100% LTV, seller finance, buy $16 million, it goes up 25%, there's your $4 million. If you're in a 6% rate of return market, you get your 20 grand a month and you're done. You know, you just got to do the math and that's where it clicks for people. You set the goal, like, this is what I want to do. Okay, what's, what do you need to do that? Not a door count. I think the door count thing is stupid. Uh, but just figure out, like, what does it take to actually get what you want? And then once you know what you want, who do you have to chat with that's done that before? I'm not saying just the seller finance thing, but who has bought $16 million of real estate and had it go up to 20? You should probably chat with them. That happens all the time. And that's how simple it is. It's not that easy, and but it's super simple. What about the why? How do you talk about the why? Because that, that one's like maybe even a little bit harder, right? You can, like what you changes? you can do math and yeah. you can say. What changes for you when your wife retires? Mm -hmm. What changed for them when their wife got to retire? Didn't have to work anymore. How did it feel coming home, your house is paid off, and your wife doesn't have to work if she doesn't want to? It's the feeling that's associated with actually hitting the goal that creates the why. People are like, well, I want to have a bunch of money in the bank and I want to have a Lamborghini. I'm like, oh, well, cool, go do it. But that's not going to make you feel any better. Probably won't. But if you, if you have someone you love and they get to do exactly what they want when they want, it feels pretty good. So I'd imagine I'm single. Wouldn't know. But hey, <laughs> I learned from a lot of people that have been there. Ladies, listening? No, I'm in. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I can definitely identify with that. I mean, uh, like uh, my financial journey, for example, does really relate in terms to my family. I mean, uh, both Alex and I are immigrants. I mean, we've both seen our family sacrifice and do so much uh, to get us to where we are today. And, you know, a big push for why we try to struggle to do better is to kind of, you know, repay and, you know, help pull others in our families up, but, you know, the same way we were helped. Um, and it's a huge motivating factor. So I know most people have some sort of aspect in their lives like that, that does motivate them beyond just the, you know, I want a Lamborghini or I want this. Uh, I mean, if you really want a Lamborghini that bad, you can, you know, save up enough to rent one one day, you know, bankrupt yourself, but whatever. Um, so there is that internal motivation that does exist with all of us. I think people just have to take the time and moment to just kind of really think about it and assess what's really important for them in their lives. 100%. And keep it super simple. You know, don't add a whole bunch of steps to the whole process. You don't want to overcomplicate it. Like that's what most people do. They add so many steps and then they're like, well, I don't want to climb this staircase. I'm like, well, if you have one step, then it's not that hard. It could be a big step, but there's not a lot of them. You'll figure it out, right? And if you, you put a whole bunch of restrictions, or not saying you, but like a lot of people put self-restrictions on the goal. Like, it would be really cool to do this, but I have to do this first. I'm like, well, why? I've met people that have played this game with kids, without kids, barely scraping by, where they le legitimately don't have an extra 10 bucks in their bank account, and they've bought 18 rental units. You know, they're barely scraping by in California and they completely changed their life position because they just figured out the strategy of, huh, if I map out my little circle and I learn about other people's, it can move me forward. Yeah, I think it's the mindset is really the biggest factor. Once you get into your mind that this is something I can accomplish, figuring out a way to do it is, is completely in the realm of possibility. I mean, if something that somebody has accomplished before, it means you can do it too. Uh, I think we even talk about it in a uh, one of our ebooks that we recently did that deals completely with mindset. I think it's the biggest, most important thing that you have to do with uh, with any type of entrepreneurial effort or you know any type of strategy towards becoming financially free. It starts all in your head. And that was going to be my well, next yeah. question, actually. Okay. Was where did you get the audacity to think that you could do this as, as a young guy? Like, what made you? Start down this path, believing oh, I rented that it was possible. It. I rented my audacity. Uh, imposter syndrome. I didn't own that. I uh, I didn't own the confidence to do any of this. I had to rent it. So 
It was borrowed from shared authority. It was borrowed from people that had done it before. Talk about instilling confidence. When you meet with someone who's done something you want to do, and you get to talk with them just on a personal level, and they tell you it is possible, and this is how you should do it, your confidence goes up. Mine did, anyways. And so I was meeting with all these owners, and the, the confidence level was just going up. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't understand how conversations worked, like pacing, phrasing. I didn't get any of it. And I learned it through meeting these owners. They gave me confidence in the real estate space. And to learn how to communicate, I did that with Starbucks baristas. I started getting into coffee because I figured if I butchered a conversation, I'd never see them again. Like, I didn't know how to talk to people. I, didn't, I was super awkward, super uncomfortable. It was a long journey in three years. But um, you know, I didn't have it. I had to borrow it from people that had already done it. They were already confident because they've been there. They've done that. And sitting on a whole bunch of cash, a whole bunch of cash flow, and a whole bunch of real estate. They're happy campers, so they're confident people. I just had to get that from them. It's a transference of emotions. Their confidence rubbed off on me, and that gave me the ability to go out there and just take on the world. Amazing. How did you feel after your first conversation? Like, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. <laughs> I thought I was really really smart human being. And today I know I'm not a very smart human, but I, I, I apply everything that I know. So I'm, I'm not, I'm usually not the smartest person in the room. I used to think I was before I started meeting with these people. But yeah, most people in the room are smarter than I am. I just go apply more stuff than they do. And because of that, it works. Uh, Cody, yeah, I wanted to totally makes sense. ask you if you could share a little bit inf of information about your your education platform because um, you know you've mentioned it to me in the past, and I think it's something that could be of a lot of value to our listeners. Uh, please, yeah, I mean the the first place, even before that, check out the YouTube channel, Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. Information's great. Uh, Having a course, I'll say, you know, information's cool and all, but application trumps information every day long. Just as we were mentioning, people are smarter, but I do more because I apply it. And uh, if you just want the info, you want to learn how to play the game, just check out the YouTube channel. We have a course that you can pay three forty nine a month for, and you could probably bust it out in a, a very long weekend. Uh, but as far as the application goes, we've got a lifetime access on that course and that comes with three months of actual consulting and we meet three times a week so we met today group call it's monday tuesday thursday and uh, monday's live q a open forum it's, it's very much like this you got questions we have answers or we have direction to get you to the right people tuesday's deal deep dive we pick apart people's deals structure the debts because when it's made up like seller financing everything's made up some people need a little bit of encouragement on pushing the terms and they get surprised when they get them. And then Thursday is an actual lesson. So we'll go over asset management, building out a team, debt structures, taking stuff private, equity, like all that. And uh, that's the multifamilystrategy.com. Now, I, I did have one last quick question on my end. Yeah. Um, so I know people after listening to this, they're probably all jazzed up. They're excited. They want to go and take what you just told them and go talk to somebody immediately. Now, how did you go and say, you know, you see this nice, you know, large uh, apartment complex, you know, across the street. How do you go about finding who the owner of that complex is and then reach getting their contact information so you can reach out to them? Yeah. Um, so I do everything with Google Maps. Google is a strong tool. I like the maps because I don't even have to walk to the property to see if I kind of like it. And so I find the big roofs. I have a video on the YouTube channel, how to find any property owner ever. It's about eight minutes long. And I gave out my personal cell number on that because I didn't want to use someone else as an example and just like put their phone number on blast. But you find the big roofs on Google and then you go to the tax assessor website and if the tax assessor has a 
in my area, it's called a map sifter. So you got the tax sifter where you can go through and see all the property taxes and all that for every property. Some counties have it for a map where it's like Google Maps. So it makes it way easier. But if it doesn't, you just go through the tax assessor, you figure out who owns it. If it's an LLC, you can take the LLC, you can put it on open corporates and you can see who owns that LLC. Also, you can plug in that person into open corporates and see every LLC that they own. You can see if they're a real player. But what I do is I figure out where are they geographically based. I'll put their their name into Google along with uh, wherever they're at, whatever city. And I'll put in phone number and it'll usually pop up just like that. And if it doesn't, then I can usually find it tagged with some uh, site because there's a lot of data on, on Google. It's, it's on the first page of Google always. But even for super famous people, like if I name dropped them, everybody that's listening would know who the people are. You can find them. And sometimes it gives you the first six digits of their phone number and then it does X, 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 X. For the, like it'll try and block it out. If you just copy the first six, put in their name, phone number, then the six, it'll, it'll actually error out Google code and give you the last. <laughs> so uh, there, there's some creative ways to do it, but I have a full video on YouTube how to find people and I've had a lot of people reach out to me that way. They're just like, I used it and I found you. Like, it's crazy how that works. Google is a cool tool. And it's all free. Make sure to put that one in the show notes. I think I was watching that one recently. I remember thinking that was just, it's there. And it's like, there's so many, I guess that's a very common problem these days, right? There's so much information and so many tools available that sometimes it's hard to find them. But that's um, really practical stuff uh, that we're going to start employing. So. Uh, Cody, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. This is really tangible, actionable stuff. And I think if we had one takeaway, it's got to be practice what you learn, right? Uh, Put it into action. Make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be afraid to uh, reach out to people, which is something that we emphasize a lot on the show. Awesome. Cody, thank you so much. Really excited to have you on the show and and just to see you again, just to reconnect. Hope to uh, see you around and... Uh, I'll keep you posted. I think uh, we'll talk about that one offline. I'll stop recording. Okay. (laughs) Sounds like a plan. (laughs) See you guys. All right. Good stuff.